It's good day to brew, baby. What is up, you dude? What Millsy? Back with hometown commander. Back for another episode of Millsy Brews, the show where I brew my version 1.0 deck list to the commander in front of us on my quest to brew the magic world. As always, that link is going to be down in the description to the deck list for you below in the description. I also well really appreciate if you could interact with the video, like, comment, subscribe. Check out the links down in the description. Come find me over on Twitter uh, or X. Um, come talk to me on some other platforms, check out the Patreon, those kind of things. But today, uh, we're covering, in all reality, a meme. Um, I think Flubs the Fool is such an interesting commander for two reasons. Number one, the art's just a meme. Like, I think the art's so good. The art's so good for what it is, but also, it's just a great commander. I think Flubs is everything you'd want in a package for a teamer deck. It's maybe not exactly what I'd want from a teamer deck, but I think it has enough things for you to choose how you want to build it, and it's a massive toolbox for you to decide what you want to care about and how you want to approach it. Flubs the Fools, a three mana zero five frog scout, so you can play additional land on each of your turns. Whenever you play a land or cast a spell, draw a card if you have no cards in hand, otherwise discard a card. Uh, the first three or four times I read Flubs, I was trying to figure out what functionally to do with it. I think the landfall makes sense, right? Getting to play extra lands, I think everybody could figure that part of that out. But the second block of text, I was trying to figure out what do I do with it? Because the problem is you're just going to end up pitching things out of your hand. Sure, we can play things that great things back of our graveyard. You know, I've used that kind of package in spell singing decks in the past. But I was like, what, what, what do we do, right? How do we... Um, accomplish that. And I thought the thing that made the most sense was Teamer has so many great pieces when it comes to playing things from Exile and caring about playing things from Exile that would kind of extend our hand, allow us to not only draw, but be able to play things that, that you know, hopefully we wouldn't have to discard and would be given an amount of time to play them. I think there's there's some package there. I'll admit, of all the videos that I've done so far for Bloomboro, I'll admit that this flubs list is not my favorite. I did my best to put... um. A deck, again, like I do in this show, that I'd be willing to play. And I think that's the important part. I try my best not in this show to just take a deck and, you know, ground out to, you know, to second. And get, just to get a video out. I think there's a lot of things I can learn from a list like this. Uh, but I just want to make sure we go into it with the understanding that no deck is perfect. And I think there's some things we can learn here as well. As far as the landfall goes, I think you're going to see a lot of the pieces you normally see in landfall lists. Vendor of Zenikar, Omnath, Locus of Rage, Lotus Cobra to get some extra mana every time your land comes in. Playing that new Springheart and Tuka, which can give us a way to go wide or put it on a key creature and make more than one copy of it, which can be interesting. Putting Springheart and Nantuko on something like Avenger of Zenikar or Lotus Cobra can be really fun. Again, we can't put it on something like Tadiova or Omnath because they're legendary, but putting on something that isn't legendary it seems like it could be a ton of fun to just make some memes, make copies of Avenger of Zenikar or, or Lotus Cobra and just kind of go wide with that. We're also playing things like Zenikar's World just to get a bunch of elementals. Again, I think the landfall package here is what you're going to expect to see elsewhere. What we really tried to tie the deck on is playing things from Exile. So almost all the deck is trying to get things into Exile, really in all reality, so that we don't have to pitch it when we play it. I think that's the big part, I think, why I focus so hard on the Exiling is... Yeah, you run the risk, right, of losing it once you get into exile, but you don't have to pitch it every time you cast a spell. You, you're you not just hemorrhaging your hand, right? I think that's the important part. We see things like Bonehorde, Dracosaur, which being our upkeep exiles the top two, and and we can play them this turn. If we exile a land card, we make a dino token. If we exile a non-land card, we make a treasure. Again, here's a great body that has an ability that's going to play into what we want to do, and Drexar will be a threat, right, at some point in the game. A Ruth Tormented Prophet feels great here. If we would draw a card, instead we exile the top two cards of our library instead, and we can play those cards this turn. A little bit of threat here, right, because a lot of our exile cards say um, you could play them until the end of your next turn, right? So things like Bonehorde, Drakasar, and Aruth are a little bit dangerous because we have to play them this turn, which means we really have to prioritize, right, those things that we're exiling. Fable Thip feels great because we could just plot cards off the top of our deck. And that feels pretty good, being able to cast them for free later and kind of storing them up, right, for the right time. Hugs comes in and just exiles the top X cards of our library until the next turn. We could play those. We could play an additional lands. We'd go up to three if we have flubs and hugs out. And I like that because then 
we're extending the number of lanes we could play. We're extending, we're, we're getting more spells we have access to. And Hugs, again, is a great body at a 5-5 five five, uh, with a trample. Lelia is probably one of the key creatures. We'll talk about the other one in a slide or two. But I think Lelia is one of the ones you're going to see in a lot of these style of lists. Whenever you exile one or more cards from your library or graveyard, you put a counter on it. So Lelia can get really big. And she exiles a card when she attacks, getting even bigger. Lelia is one of those threats that hopefully you can build up and start having your opponents having to deal with. Escape to the Wilds, come another card up this vein, exile the top five. Can play them until the end of our next turn, or you could play an additional land. So again, getting us another land that we could play, getting us cards that we could play that are protected for being exiled. Really what we're trying to do in this section is get things into exile and to play. On the next slide, we're going to start talking about how we're going to pay off the fact that we're playing them from exile. Ignite the future, exile the top three, to the end of your next turn, you could play them. But if we flash it back, we get to play them for free. Mizzix Master is kind of the first of my ways to try to take this potentially large graveyard where we've been pitching cards and casting things and just cast them, everything back out of our graveyard for eight mana. The cool part here is you exile them and then cast them from exile. Um, you cast the copy from exile, meaning we're going to trigger all of our exile triggers and we're going to get to recast hopefully all those really good spells. And then Jessica's Will plays double duty. It can get us a bunch of red mana or it can exile the cards from our top. Uh, Jessica's Will is always a great turn when you can do both if Flubs is out and just get access to a bunch of mana and some extra things. But as far as exile payoffs go, I think the card that made really one of the first things I added to the deck was Faldorn. Faldorn headed up its own precon. This is whenever you cast a spell from exile or a land enters from exile, make a 2-2 two -two wolf. So we're just going to go wide on wolves, hopefully, make an army that way. We could, we could tap it and discard a card to exile the top card of our library, and we could play it this turn again. Just a way to continue to feed into our own ability. Um, Flaming Tyrannosaurus is interesting. Whenever we cast a spell from anywhere other than our hand, three damage to any target, and you put a counter on it. When it dies, it deals damage equal to its power to each opponent. I, I do kind of wish that the Paradox effect was like two damage to everybody and then put the counter on. I just feel like it would hit a little bit harder, right, for the seven mana that it costs. But hey, it's going to be a threat and it has menace, so it's going to be hard to block. Keeper of Secrets, very similar ability. Whenever we cast a spell from any other than our hand, it deals damage equal to that spell's mana value to target opponents. So if we cast a big spell from Exile, we'd start doling out this damage. Same thing with Pashed Archaeologist, very similar thing. Dealing damage to an opponent for that spell's mana value. And then memory word is kind of interesting. Whenever we cast a spell from anywhere other than our hand, two damage to target player, that player discards a card, then then draws a card, and then we put a counter on the worm. So the worm's just going to keep getting bigger. At the end of the day, there's a lot of ways to take this exile thing. I'm kind of going airplane view over it because this playing from exile mechanic it's one of those mechanics sometimes where you just got to get your hands dirty and play it in game. It's easy to talk about fundamentally, but it's hard to manage once you actually sit in a game and figure it out. And I don't really know how you know to, to, to display that the best I can think of on a presentation. I'm excited to get into our play tests because I think we can help kind of have fun trying to determine what the actual heck is going on with Flubs as a commander. But... I think I need you to understand that this is a deck that's going to cause uh, probably some confusion because it's going to take a little bit to get that rhythm in. Understanding when to push, when not to. I think a lot of decks probably want to play flubs. You know, a lot of people think, oh, I got to play my commander right when I get that uh, right perfect amount of mana. But I think we really got to stop and consider when's the best time to play flubs and when's the best time to start new mechanic getting going, but I've said it on the show and I'll say it again, no decks ever complete. This is my version 1.0 shot at this list. I think there's a lot of things that can be learned with testing. Number one, ratios. I try my best to balance what I think feels right between landfall and playing from exile, but I have absolutely no idea. I'll be honest, again, I think testing is gonna teach us a lot. And these are three cards that I think could be really helpful. The first is Future Sight, although they're on the right. Playing with the top card of our library revealed, and we could play the top card of our library. Feels really good to play lands off the top. Know what's going up. Know what we want to draw into with, with flubs and things like that. Feels really good. We have a bunch of other ways to do this. It's not like we don't have any of that specifically. But, I mean, it could be a good, you know, another piece for it. And then on the landfall side, you know, Tireless Provisioner is a great landfall payoff to get you treasures and foods and get you a bunch of other things. Same thing with the Shia, turning all creatures that come in into lands, letting us get more non-creature tokens, or non-token creatures coming in 
into lands, giving us more of those landfall triggers. Uh, again, I like both of these effects. I just wasn't sure how much to commit into landfall or, you know, to commit into exile. And I think this is potentially one thing we could learn a lot as we get into testing and figuring it out. So as we get into our play tests, we got to try to find this balance between using Flub's effect. Because remember, no matter what, if we play a land or cast a spell, we have to pitch a card. There's no choice. So we have to remember that when we're doing this, we need to do it efficiently and do it smartly. To start off here, we got a four lander with Party Thrasher, which allows us to convoke for spells we cast from exile, which is pretty cool. Start of our pre at main phase, we can pitch a card. If we do exile the top two, and we can play them this turn. Corsair Crufex lets us look at the top. It, it plays with a, the top card revealed. We can play lands on the top. Whenever land comes in, we gain a life. And then Wild Wasteland, we skip our draw step. At the beginning of our upkeep, we exile the top two cards, so we could play those cards this turn. So we have some exile effects, we have some land effects, right? So we got a good mix here. Let's get into it. We see Scoot Swarm, which is a great way to start. Scooty is one of those cards that can definitely take over a game if left unchecked. There's a Ruth, so we're starting to see, right, a good mix of our... Um, our abilities here. I don't think there's anything for us to do except uh, Party Thrasher here on turn two. I don't think that we want to do Party Thrasher this turn. I think we want to focus. My gut tells me I want to get Scoot Swarm down here. Because the turn I play with Flubs, I can play two lands, which means I could get multiple Scoot Swarm triggers. Uh, the Aquarius, right? The only problem with that is once I put Flubs down, then this wheeling and dealing starts. And I think this is where. To be 100% honest, this is where the entire finesse of the deck comes in. I, I hate to be a broken record, but I want to make sure you understand if this is a deck you're trying to build, you've got to understand that this pitch and draw thing has to be a finesse. You get yourself understanding and you work your way towards getting better at it, mastering it, understanding how it functions. So to me, this turn, I would probably commit to playing... Um, some lands. Now I'm going to lose a couple cards for it, but I think Flubs feels right here this turn. Play the Shivan Reef. That's going to get me a 1 1 insect. And I have to pitch a card. And, right, I can play Ignite the Future back out of my graveyard. So I think that's an option. A Ruth's also an option. A Ruth's one of those creatures that slightly scares me. That's a lot of exile. Because remember, Flub says if we would draw a card, you know, pitch, otherwise we draw, and a roof's just going to put more things into exile. I just, I get slightly afraid that we might go too deep on that. So I think I'm going to pitch a roof for now. Play the other land, make another insect, and I think we'll go for Ignite the Future. And now we've um, got ourselves in fairly good shape. I guess the argument could be made that we are roof there instead and, you know, get to be able to use Party Thrasher, right, to help convoke since we have these Scoot Swarm tokens out. Again, there's a lot of way to view this deck and how we should maneuver it, and I'm even still figuring out, going through the process of showing it off for y'all. But we go into turn five. I like Wild Wasteland. Man, I like Flaming Tyrannosaurus, but there's no way for me to get that set up. I think I'd play the Wasteland. I guess pitch Tyrannosaurus. This would have probably been the perfect turn from a Ruth. But, like I said, I, now I don't have anything else to play, right? So this is kind of that awkward thing where we can take a couple attacks. Maybe maybe this would have been the turn to a Party Thrasher, right? If we knew we were going to get rid of... If I go back here, right? Maybe this is the turn where we Party Thrasher. We pitch uh, Corsair Crufix to exile the top two. Um, but see, then, then, the, then the problem is, what if we hit something we can't play? For example, Avenger Zenicar now... I'm what five six seven actually I can right I can I can convoke it out pitching I guess the Tyrannosaurus again it feels odd here this comes in and makes me what five plants and then that wonder unfortunately is gone right because I have to play it this turn and I can't tap any of the Plants for blue. I guess I could have left a blue up for the wonder. All right, but, all right we missed that one. And um, we'll go into our next turn here. So Party Thrasher can go off again. We see Fortune Teller's Talent. We can look at the top part of our library at any time. And if we exile it up, we can start playing things off the top. I think I'm going to do the Thrasher, pitch the Talent. 
we get a Beast Within and a Drake Haven. So Drake Haven says whenever we cycle or discard a card, we could pay one. If we do, we make a Drake, and then Beast Within will, right, will destroy something. Man, but no land here, which is kind of brutal. But, um, I was going to say, I can convoke out this Drake Haven. I've got to pitch the Wild Wasteland, and unfortunately that happens in response to the cast, so I don't, I don't get to pay the one for the Drake there. Might as well use the Beast Within right on something, and that'll draw us a card. Playing Sulphur Falls will get us a copy of Scoot Swarm. We'll get us a counter on all of our plants, and we'll draw us another card. Still got mana left, so we can play that Arcane Answer, draw a card. I think we'd have enough left for Teddy as well. So this was not a bad turn, getting to put some more things on board. We'll go one more turn here. We we'll see a Brass's Tunnel Grinder. I think I'm willing to pitch it for, uh, for Party Thrasher. So, um... Oh, that's right. Party Thrasher is picking one of them. Damn it. Well, I missed that one. Nothing I can do about that. We'll pick the landscape here, I guess. Play it. Draw from Flubs. Draw from Tatiova. Make the copy of that. Get a counter on all of our plants. Play another land. Discard the land, right? Another Scoot Swarm token. Counter on all of our lands. And I think when draw a card from Teddy Hoover, right? And I think here we've, we're kind of pushing our nice way towards value here using Party Thrasher to pitch things. Playing, you know, our lands and moving out. I feel like I kind of, oh man, what a bad time to make a pun, but I feel like I kind of flubbed with that one. So let's go to Playtest 2. Again, I apologize. I apologize for this being a little bit less um, clean than some other playtests, but the truth is I think this is just a very tough commander to understand, and even I'm still working my time, but here we are, another four lander, wild wasteland, goblin, Ar goblin archaeomancer, and pass in flames, which can give all instant sources in our graveyard flashback. So that's kind of a fun uh, potentiality. So we'll go uh, get a mountain down here, we'll get a forest down, get that archaeomancer down right, start making things a little bit cheaper. Turn three, I mean, there's a world where we could just go deep on Jessica's will. I mean, Farseek's only costing me one green mana, and Wild the Wasteland would cost me two. So I think I do this and Farseek. Go ahead and get something like our Triome, just to give us another, um, another piece that's tapping for more colors of mana. And I think we're going to maybe potentially look to Flubs this turn. Let's see, so Flubs can pay two, two lands, right? So we go for Flubs. Oh, sorry, I apologize. We don't draw because of the Wasteland. We exile the top two, and we can play those this turn. So Forest and Keeper of Secrets. So Keeper of Secrets is six mana. I would pretty much have to Jessica's Will, right, in order to do that. I play Flubs, play the Forest, and then... Just because, well, I could still play the Keeper, right? So let's do that. Let's play Flubs. Play the Forest from Exile. I have to pitch a card. We'll pitch the Past in Flames since I can flash, flash it back, right? Pay Red and One for Just because, well. We'll pitch a land. Floating Seven Red and... I was going to say, I guess Seven Red and... I was going to say, and exile the top three. So let's see if this gets me into any trouble. There's a second land. There's the keeper, right? That's what we kind of came here for. We've got seven red to do it. So, so I guess we'll just cast it. And until the end of my... In this turn. So these guys are going to get kind of... But when I play that, I have to pitch the coast. All right. Well, again, another turn where we, we learned a lesson, I just realized I would have had one extra mana, so I could have played that Nature's Lore because of the uh, Goblin Arcane Answer. So let's do it. That would end up drawing me a card because of... Uh, because of... Uh, uh, that draws me a card from Flubs and then two damage from Keeper of Secrets. Moving to the next turn, turn five, another land. Uh, but remember, that gets exiled with Fable Passage. So two lands in exile. Interesting. Um, 
Well, I'll play the Henge to draw a card, and then I'll get to surveil one. Anger. Oh, well, I want anger in the graveyard, right, to give haste. Then, let's see, I haven't spent any mana this turn, right? So I'll play a Ruth from hand instead. Uh, I would draw on cast, right? So that's not something I can get away with that I have to do on cast. So I've got four mana left. Because whenever I would draw a card, exile the top two anyway. So Delayed Blast, Fireball. I would really like to get exiled, but that's okay. I think here on turn five, it might just be worth hard casting. Instead of drawing, I get to exile the top two. Play them this turn. Eek, that feels brutal. Yeah, this is, and I'll be 100% honest, this, this is where I, with the deck, I, I'm having a tough time because just so much of the deck just seems like you're wheeling and dealing and you're leaving things on the table. It's just, I apologize, it's not a deck style I'm 100% in on, but I want to show it to you because at the end of the day, I think it's important to try things sometimes because I have no way of knowing if these two are on the top, right? I think you you want to, I mean, I guess, I guess technically I could have played that island, pitched the delayed blast, and we would have been off to the races next turn but I mean right my question here to you is how do you know I know that sounds it might sound whiny to some people it might sound um apologetic to some people but it's the truth like I think this is one of those decks that you kind of just have to understand that you're wheeling and dealing this is true chaos and you have to understand that you have to have some sort of risk factor and that's the thing I think to me that is very hard for me to understand and kind of acclimate to but let me know what do you think of flubs down in the comment section below again not my thing I appreciate what flubs does I think it's a really interesting idea for a commander and I'm sure there's going to be, be people out there who absolutely enjoy flubs and make this deck better than I can ever see it and I can't wait to get uh, to play against one but thank you guys so much for watching and I will catch you guys